let's sing that chorus a cappella all together. You sound good tonight. Here we go. Little is much, we God is in than you do on this side. And I didn't understand that as a young man. But uh, Bowie and I were just sitting down there there talking about the fact that uh, we're, of course, I'm 46. She's much, much younger than me. She wants to point that out all the time. But uh, 46, in the last year, a uh, good friend of mine growing up died of cancer. Another good friend of mine's wife died of cancer. These are people in their 40s, 50s, right in that. Uh, Bowie had a, a good friend, missionary friend, Chris Anderson, died just unexpectedly. And uh, these are people in their 40s and 50s. And uh, already we have pastors and mamas and papas and aunts and uncles. But now we're starting to have more and more of our childhood friends. And so those songs, as you get older, take on different meaning. When we all get to have, what a day of, hey, there's my, not just family, but there's friends and high school buddies and elementary school buddies. And I'm glad we have a great hope beyond this life. Amen. I'm glad we're not, I, living for now is okay. We live a better life than the lost. I was just talking to Brother David Hall. The consequence of sin is always trouble. So the believer has a better life now, but we have a promised life to come. And so just a, a great, great song, great history that we sing that song. And as you get older, songs begin to take on different meanings to you. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm not ready to leave on the first load out tonight, but I'm ready if called. Amen. We're glad you're here. I'm going to have a great time. I was thinking about this. As a young preacher, we were taught to be ready to preach, pray, or die. And that means just right on the spot. And we were having men's prayer. And uh, right as I was making my last request before I went to prayer, uh, Jacob Hassinger walked in the door. And I said, and Lord, just help Jacob as he preaches tonight to the church. And Jacob said, Lord, don't listen to that prayer. Amen. But I am going to have one of our young men come preach tonight just for a moment. And we're excited. The Lord's, and I'm having a blast teaching over the college. And uh, we had a great time. Uh, Caleb and Jacob taught, uh, preached Monday. The rest of them will preach tomorrow. I'm going to have Caleb early come in just a few moments and bring a uh, short message. And he's excited. And his wife's excited. <laughs> you know what a wife does when a preacher preaches? Praise. Amen. Oh, God. Jesus, help him. Lord, please, God. All right. Let's pray together. Good to have. Uh, Brother Hurst back, he was on the road for a couple weeks, couldn't have him. His daughter back in town. She's here for Mother's birthday, supposedly, but yet we haven't seen much of her. There's Melissa slid in as well, so we got both girls. Mother turned 31 again this year. It's a blessing, and uh, she's wearing 31 out pretty good now. If you're a guest tonight, this is your first time, first time in a long time, would you slip your hand up just all over the auditorium? 
looks like mostly home folks, maybe a face or two, but mostly home folks here. Uh, let's uh, go, Lord, in prayer, asking to bless this time. Father, bless the service now. We want you to be pleased. And, Lord, we look forward to seeing young men that have been called and trained, sent out into the ministry. Lord, let this place be a launching point that we have a model that they can take and go not only around America but around the world and win souls and try to love people and help folks and, most of all, follow you. I pray you bless the preaching of thy word, the music. Already my heart's been encouraged, Lord, when we all get to heaven. What a day. And, Lord, I'm longing for that day. It's sweeter now than it's ever been. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help our people to be ready for that day. If there's one yet lost or not ready for that day, I pray, you God, you'd help them. And, Lord, do something in this place tonight. Prepare us for a great week. We have no idea what the week holds. Just was told a moment ago that one of the girls that we've been trying to reach, her 15-year-old brother passed away. Lord, there's unexpected things going to come our way this week. And so, God, I pray you'd help us to be ready to give that good answer of Jesus to those that ask. Bless this time now, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Listen as the choir sings. Us our missions moment for the week, and uh, one of my favorite missionaries we support is our missionary of the week. You listen, Brother David comes. I wasn't going to say anything about Sunday school, but uh, <laughs> oh, hey man, go um, ahead. I had a couple people in my class that I need to say something, so I'll just say this if you're looking for a corruptible crown, there's other classes. If you're looking for an incorruptible crown, <laughs> then you can come to the practical Christian living class. So. <laughs> All right, let's get to the missionary of the week. Uh, <laughs> I figure Brother Rick would. Uh, our missionaries of the week are the Doolittles, uh, Stephen and Kelly, great people uh, in Brazil. They've been there about four and a half years. In fact, at the beginning of this year, they're coming off for furlough for about a year, so you pray for them. And their kids are getting old. Philip, their oldest one, has graduated from high school. It's hard to believe that's the case, but it is. And... Um, they're, they're um, let me say this, um, 
They've had some record attendance in their churches over the last short while, so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, we were all watching the World Cup and enjoying it, but they were kind of not happy about it because they couldn't even get people to come to church or they couldn't even get them in to go to their homes to conduct a Bible study. So there's, I guess there's always a, a good and a bad in thing. Uh, they're really praying about a pastor taking over what work there they had started. They have about three churches started, and they were coming off the furlough, uh, worried about that. So they finally got a pastor, Pastor Rule. So he's taking over the work, a national pastor. That's an answer to prayer there. They've been taking some short-term missionary trips down to the river to some people to try to minister to them. And uh, sometimes you have to change things up. They had a church, they, one of their church plants that was right in the middle of town. They weren't seeing much results, so they moved the church. Since they moved the church, 15 people have gotten saved. So we just pray for that. Continue to pray for the Doolittles as they do a great work in, the, in Brazil for the Lord. Kelly have been on the field uh, a good long, four and a half years this last term, but uh, we've been supporting them since that little boy that graduated high school was just a little boy. And uh, so it's a neat thing to see uh, someone being faithful. In fact, Jonathan's sister, Danae, went down to work with the Doolittles for a period of time after she graduated high school. All right, Brother Caleb, I want you to get your Bible ready, and I want you to preach with your wife behind you, because that's a new experience for you. So you come on up and uh, get your Bibles ready. Listen, as Caleb brings uh, our first message of the evening, all right? And uh, you, got, you got your mic turned on, Brother Caleb? All right. He's so excited. Praise the Lord. Amen. I am nervous as I'll get up. I'll tell you what. Uh, so um, this is a message that um, I got to speak to in a nursing home. And it was something that as I was reading through Philippians, um, the Lord really spoke to my heart. Um, let's pray first. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Just want to thank you just for um, what, a, what a great night, what a great day that you've given to us, Lord, and just this wonderful church that we can be in, Lord. Um, Lord, I just pray that you just be with me. Lord, just calm my nerves. Um, just, Lord, just help me just to say that what you want me to say through this message that you gave to me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, if we take our Bibles, we'll turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Um, here we find that Paul is writing to the, the church at Philippi and his bonds. And um, reading through this, uh, it showed me a lot about Paul's life. Um, he was uh, a man that was excited for the Lord to be magnified in his body, no matter what came, came into his life. It was something that stuck out to me the most, and it's a verse that I've read many, many of times. Is in uh, verse 27, um, I see that there's two calls here, but a call that you can't have without the other. Uh, so we're beginning reading in verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. Amen. Uh, the first thing I see is a call to persevere. It says, only let your conversation become as, the, or as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Um, this is to say that to live appropriately to the gospel. Um, the call to persevere is that we should strive that our lives should promote the gospel. Um, now, I want to ask you, ask you all two questions about your lives that you only need to answer to God. My first question is, does your life promote the gospel? When people look at your life, what do they see? Um, do, uh, do they see not yourselves, but Christ and what he has done in your life? Philippians 1, uh, verse 20 through 21, it says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so do also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. The first thing I could think of is wow. Paul says that even in his bonds and his afflictions, that his body, Christ, shall be magnified. It does not matter if it's in life or death. Um, and he wanted the, the church, we see that Paul wanted the church of Philippi to remain steadfast. Um, and just the today, Christ wants us to stay steadfast for the gospel. My second question is, does your, um, does your lives put down the gospel? Philippians 2, verse 14 through 15, it says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, 
that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shall ye shine as lights in the world. Here's Paul is talking about their testimonies in a crooked and perverse nation. And I couldn't help but think of our nation today. A nation that pushes gods out of their schools, that promotes sex, drugs, and the philosophy that you should live your life the way you want to live it, not the way God wants you to live it. And he says no matter what, he's going to persevere. And no matter what, he wanted the church at Philippi to persevere. And no matter what, Christ wants us to persevere for the gospel's sake. Um, I had a friend um, one time. And one time. Um, I had a friend. And um, we were sitting down talking. And um, we were talking about another friend. There was a little bit of contention between this other, this other friend. We were sitting down talking. And this other uh, this other. Um, Christian wasn't, uh, or said that she was Catholic, or Catholic or Lutheran, she wasn't saved. And the only thing I can remember from that whole conversation is that if that is what it means to be a Christian, I don't want that. And the only thing I could think of is that that's what it means to be saved and go to heaven, not go to hell, I don't want that. What, the way you live your life is important because it could, people seeing you the way you live your life could be the, if, whether someone gets saved or not. So first we see a call to persevere. Next we see a call to unity. And it says in um, chapter 27, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving for the faith of the gospel. So first uh, we want to look at the goal, which is the gospel of Christ. It says, striving together for the faith of the gospel. The, do- the definition of gospel is good news. The gospel of Christ, his good news is his death, burial, and resurrection. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This should be the goal of every believer, whether seeing you living it, seeing people, people seeing you live it in your own lives, or you out, or you're going out telling someone uh, what God did in your life. Then you see uh, how to reach this goal. Stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together. We work together to be a witness to proclaim Christ. We proclaim that Christ, what his goal was, is to seek and to save that which is lost, and that is our goal. The individual perseveres in their own life style for Christ. Then the individuals come together to reach the goal with one mind and with one spirit spreading the gospel. And here, as one man put it, all of our desires and emotions concentrated on one objective, all acting together for one great work. And then you see in Acts uh, chapter 1-8, But ye shall, receive af- ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and on the uttermost parts of the earth. The apostles worked together so that they could see many people saved at the day of Pentecost. Because it says in uh, chapter, or, uh, chapter 2 of Acts, verse 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it sat upon each of them sat upon each and every one of them, about 120. The Holy Spirit rested on them and that 3,000 people got saved. Um, Let us work together in prayer for for each other that we might be great witnesses. This is our goal. Now, how are you living your life? Are you living in a way that promotes the gospel, that magnifies Christ? Or are you hurting the cause of Christ that people do not want to come to God because of the way you live your life? And then are we unified together? I'll say unified together as a church to reach the goal of spreading the gospel. Lord, Heavenly Father, we can be for you, Lord. just want to thank you just for this time. Lord, I just pray that you just bless the rest of the service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good job. Amen. Amen. They do such a good job in class. And uh, I want you to start uh, hearing these guys. And, uh, of course, Caleb, let me tell you, he's earned this. Uh, he works full-time, goes to school full-time, uh, runs a bus route, uh, works in several different ministries. The pulpit is not something you just get handed to. You pay your dues. And he's paying his dues. He's behind the scenes, a lot of stuff. He's there every week, an hour before church, running the sound. He's here many times an hour after church doing practices. And that's the kind of young man I'm looking for is a man that doesn't want to be up here, but is ready to be up here. 
And a lot of guys want to be the preacher, but they don't want to be the bus captain. They don't want to be the, the sound guy. They don't want to do the behind the scenes stuff. And that's why I love Caleb and Nicole so much because they are willing to pay the price. And so well, we appreciate that. Jacob, how you doing, buddy? Amen. Good. All right, let's all stand together. And we're going to let the choir come down and find their seat. You find somebody good to see my boys tonight. God bless you. Love you. Glad you're here this evening. All right, as you're making your way back to your seat there, let's sing this next song, 327, Springs of Living Water. Sing with me on the first. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful. How many of you, that's the first time you've ever heard that song? All right, not that many. A few of you look puzzled. Sing out on that second. All together, how sweet the living water. How sweet the living water from the hills of God. It makes me glad and happy all the way. Now glory, grace, and blessing mark the path I've trod. I'm shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come today to Calvary? A fountain there is flowing deep and wide. The Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh wonderful and bountiful supply. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, Brother Tyler has uh, given me the report. He was going to run home and check on Miss Julie. She got sick. Uh, during the song service, and uh, I have had all day, I told the men this morning prayer, just kind of a, a nauseous feeling, just kind of not right, so I don't know if, if there's something going around, but you pray for Miss Julie, ran home, and uh, pray for Tyler, but he did give me the report. 
for the Sunday school classes for the week. Kids, I, and I'm going to let you see it after I read it. Because some of you may think that I would be like not telling the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. In the children's division, the children's division, in third place with 128.57%, Dale Davis, first through third grade boys. In second place, in second place, with 133.33%, Jacob Hassinger, fourth through sixth grade boys. Second place. And in first place, claiming again week number two with 136.36% of the vote, first through fourth grade girls, Jane Kelly. I'll meet you halfway. I'll meet you. Amen. All right. Congratulations, Miss Kelly. Good job, young ladies. In the Super Six Division, Super Six, in third place, with 80%, third place goes to the Fisher of Men, Scott Sawmill. <laughs> Scott, you didn't get much of a clap, man. It was kind of like a golf clap. Like, okay, okay, good. Second place, slipping one notch with 83.3%. The single women in fellowship, the Swifties in second place, Miss Pam Carver. First place, a new first place winner in the Super Six Division with 141.67%. A little help from the Hearst ladies coming in. Single vision class, first place for the week. There he is. Very good. One of them, nine business. Nine visitors, nine visitors, all right. And then in the one that matters. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, no, they all matter. Third place in the big five, practical Christian living, 97.73% David Hall. Excuse me. Second place, excuse me. With 107.69, the couples class. What happened to you people? All I ask you to do is come to Sunday school. First place, week number two in the big five. With 110% even, the auditorium Bible class, Paul Hangay. Good job, good job. All right, hey, that's good. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but we were way up this week in Sunday school. And folks, if we get them in Sunday school, they're going to stay for church, okay? So let's work hard next week, make some phone calls. Uh, our class, we're going to make a little push because we, we had second place. And, you know, second place is just first loser. So we want to get in there, you know, get after it. But praise the Lord, working hard. And uh, Brother Jonathan just told me they had nine visitors this week in their class. And that's what it's all about, nine visitors, getting folks to come to Sunday school, and so be faithful there. Take your Bible, the book of Ephesians, please, and uh, one verse tonight, chapter number five, and uh, we're going to read that in just a moment. I want my wife to come, and uh, mixed quartet, and they're going to sing for us while you're finding Ephesians chapter number five. Father, I pray now you bless the reading of thy word. I pray you'd help me now to be on point tonight. Thank you for Caleb, and Lord, I'm so hopeful, so hopeful for the future with Young men like he and his precious wife and beside him, Lord, to do a great work. Lord, I pray you'd help our young men that are training to realize that this is a battleground and we're training for a lifetime of ministry. God, I pray you'd help them. Bless our church tonight. Stir us and strengthen us for the week ahead, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. You listen as a quartet sings. Feeling mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. Heaven on my mind. Heaven on my mind, to know I want to go, yes I 
I want to go. Milk and honey flow, milk and honey flow. Life that always shines, life that always shines. In this heart of mine, in this heart of mine. I'm feeling fine. Well, I woke up this morning feeling fine. I woke up with heaven on my mind. I woke up with joy in my soul. Cause I knew my Lord had control. Well, I knew I was walking in the light. Cause I've been on my knees in the night. And I prayed till the Lord gave a sign. Feeling mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. Heaven on my mind. Heaven on my mind. Oh, I want to go. Yes, I want to go. Milk and honey flow. Milk and honey flow. Light that always shines. Light that always shines. In this heart of mine. In this heart of mine. Heaven on my mind. Heaven on my mind. Yes, I'm feeling fine. I've been, I've been walking with Jesus all the time. We're walking and talking as we climb. We're traveling a road to the sky. Where I know I'll live when I die. He's been telling me all about that land. And he tells me that everything is grand. And he says that a home will be mine. And now I'm feeling mighty fine. Well, I'm feeling mighty fine. Yes, I'm feeling fine. Heaven on my mind. Heaven on my mind. Oh, I want to go. Yes, I want to go. Milk and honey flow. Milk and honey flow. Light that always shines. Light that always shines. In this heart of mine, in this heart of mine, heaven on my mind, heaven on my mind, feeling mighty fine, yes I'm feeling fine. I used to call him Big Rob, I'm just going to call him Smooth Rob now, Smooth Rob. D.L. Moody made this statement, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. Think about that Sunday school thing, and I know we, we tease about it, and we've had a good time, and I do think that we ought to have open mics so that all the teachers can have their say in front of the church. But, you know, you come to Sunday school, you come to church, not because necessarily you want to, but because necessarily you need to. You need to. You don't always do what you want to do, but you do what you need to do. And uh, Sunday school and church and faithfulness to the Word of God, that'll help you. And so if we can make a little fun and enjoy a little bit uh, to promote some camaraderie and provoke one another to good works, I'm for it. But the bottom line, I want you to hear the Word of God every week uh, in a classroom from a teacher that loves you, that prays for you. Uh, my wife and I pray for our class. I know each of our teachers, they pray for the people in their class. They're there to help. And you be faithful. Be uh, brief tonight. I'll try to be brief tonight. But I want you to look at one verse, Ephesians chapter 5. We stayed for weeks and weeks and weeks in chapter 4. And uh, we said, let him that steal no more, verse 28, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, and may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed in the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, we've looked at that and that's just a sample of the verses that we've dealt with. And last week especially we talked about the putting off of the old wrong things and the putting on of the new right things. We've dealt with specific issues about life and there's things that we need to guard and I, I mentioned you know that, that, that anger I, I don't want to ever preach another message on anger because the Lord had a way of reminding you the week following that about keeping that anger in check 
And we talked about our tongue and evil communication. And, and the Lord has a way of reminding you about that during the week. And, and so we've talked for several months now about those sin areas of our life that God wants us to deal with. And he says, man, you've got to watch this and you've got to guard this and you've got to keep from that and put this away from you. And now we come to verse number 1 of chapter 5. He says, be ye therefore. Now as we always know as we study the word of God, when we find the therefore, it's a transitional statement that ties the previous thought to a new thought. And so here he comes in verse number 1 of chapter 5, and he says, Now therefore, we've talked about putting all this off. He says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And so he transitions from don't do that and don't do this and do this and don't do this and this is what you ought to do. And he says, Now listen, listen. Follow God. Follow God. And that's what I want to give you tonight, just two very quick thoughts. What we are to do is to follow God. What we are to do, if you are a Christian, and I, I say that like you say, preacher, everybody here at Sunday night, we're all Christians. You don't know that. And that's not true. There's a lot of folks that come to church and they have a lot of valid reasons for coming to church, but the truth is they're not Christians and their heart's desire is not to follow God. As a believer, when I wake up in the morning, my first thought is, Lord, what do you have for me today? Lord, what can I do for you today? Lord, today is the day I want to follow you. Amen. But a lot of people don't wake up with that thought. They don't have a God thought all day. What they do on the weekends is just what they do. It's a repetition they do. It's a routine they do. And they don't have a desire to follow God. But if the Spirit of God indwells you and the Word of God is coursing through your mind and your heart and what you're meditating on and you're feeding, you're filling up with the Word of God, there is a desire and there ought to be a desire that every one of us that name the name of Christ ought to have a passionate burning, heartfelt desire to follow Him. Amen. Above all else, we ought to follow Him. Now, very quickly, and again, I didn't feel well this afternoon. I, I didn't get as much time as I'd like to get in. I only found 17. I did, I found 17. But I'll be helpful to you. Some of these are repeating, so I'm not going to repeat them all. But I, I looked to the Gospels just for, for a moment this afternoon. And I found the 17 places where Jesus told a specific person or groups of people, follow me. And I, I took that 17 and narrowed it down to just a handful. And I want to give you tonight what we're to do. We're to follow God. And in Matthew chapter 4, 19, one of the most famous places is where he said unto them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So number one tonight, if we're going to follow God, we're going to follow him for the souls of men. For the souls of men. Now I want to repeat to you what I've said to you for the last several weeks. You are where you are because God wants you to be there for a specific person. For a specific reason. There is somebody that's going to cross your path in the next 24 hours or 48 hours or 72 hours, they'll not cross my path. They'll not cross Paul's path. They'll not cross Tyler's path. They'll not cross anybody's path but yours. And as a child of God, a born-again believer, you have been put in their life to intersect with them and to interact with them and to maybe even ask them the question, do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? Oh, oh Brother Stancil, what if I offended them? with that question or talking about spiritual things. And I heard a preacher say this, and I say it kindly and sweetly, and I don't want to be harsh, but where are you going to offend them to that they're not already going? Hell number two? You're standing in the gap. You're the person, and as you follow Christ, Christ is going to lead you. I heard Brother Chapel say uh, years ago, another Chapel reference. I heard Brother Chapel say years ago that uh, God gives us divine appointments along the way. These were not people we intended to see or planned to see, but somehow, some way, God put them in our path. The other day, Brother Dustin brought a young man in on Wednesday night and brought him to church, and Brother Rick Boswell had the privilege to lead him to Christ. And Brother Dustin said, Man, I was just at the Circle K gas station. Here's a guy standing there, and I'm a guy standing there. 
there. And all of a sudden we got to talking. And the next thing you know, I started asking him about his condition and his state and asking if he'd like to go to church. And goodness gracious, he said yes, brought him in. And the other soul winner come along and led him to Christ. Hey, that was just a big accident. That was just coincidence. That was just pure, dumb, blind luck. No, that was a provident appointment. That was a predestined in God's plan. He put Dustin in that man's path so that Dustin could speak to him about eternal life. Amen. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and then let, me, let me explain my statement. I want to be very careful. We're going to teach a soul-winning course in the next couple of weeks, brother. Sister uh, Petrie brought us back a soul winning course and we're going we're gonna to look at that and, and, and get our people that don't have a good understanding of winning people to Christ. But let me, let me just transfer this thought. You ought not to be a person who goes soul winning as much as you ought to be a soul winner. Amen. Right. See, I like the idea of Tuesday night soul winning. I like the idea of Saturday morning soul winning. But I love the idea of you just being so conscious. And as you follow God about your day, you may be talking to a repairman or a co-worker or a business friend, but God's going to open your heart and open their heart and going to put you in a place where they didn't need a preacher yesterday and they don't need a preacher tomorrow. They need a friend right now that's got some answers to some questions that nobody else can answer and you're going to be able to step in for Christ. Hey, being so conscious is what happens when a person follows Christ. You just, you just, it's a byproduct. It's a natural byproduct of a follower of Christ to be soul conscious. If I guilt you into ministry or press you into ministry or conscript you into ministry, you won't stay in ministry long. But if you're following Christ in ministry, it'll be a natural byproduct. If I press you or force you or conscript you into soul winning for maybe a, a campaign or a season, you may or may not do it. But if you're following Christ, you won't need anybody to push because there's an inner pull drawing you into the lives of people and to the souls of men. Number one, as we follow Christ, we'll follow him for the souls of men. Number two, Matthew chapter 8. But Jesus said unto him, and I won't read all the context of these. You're certainly welcome to, to go and read them. But here's a gentleman that said, I'll follow you, but I've got to take care of my family first. Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Follow me. Follow me. Over family. Over friends. Over comfort. Follow me. Pre Preacher, I do that, but you know, I've got this going on. Let me take care of this first. I've never met a person. Now listen, this is just a true story. I've never met a person who didn't have a reason they couldn't serve God. We all have reasons. And if you don't have a reason, ask me. I'll give you one. Because I've heard them all. And many, if not all of them, are valid reasons. Well, I'm busy. Oh, I'm, I bless your heart. I'm tired. I'll double bless your heart. I'm not trained. I understand. I don't have this, my, this, that, there. At some point, you're going to have to make a choice. Right. Family, comfort, familiarity, or follow Jesus. Right. For us and our family, it was a decision to leave, to leave our home in the south and our family and the family business and go north. And, and you say, preacher, you tell that story now and it's a great, tri tri a great triumph and it's a great blessing. And it was, but I'm going to tell you, it was the number one. I'm gonna, I, I don't... This, there's no way to make, make this any clearer. It was by far the hardest decision I've ever made. Because I have a wife now, and I have, uh, uh, you know, it's not, just, it's not just a random thing, and it was a wife, and it was all these other pressures and where to go and what to do, and, 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 and it was a hard, it was harder than my call to preach, my call to go away to college. The call to preach, I settled it. Okay, Lord, I'll preach. Just, just leave me alone. I remember that. But where to go train? And, and when the Lord put Michigan, Detroit, Pontiac, I'm thinking, Lord, Pensacola. I'm thinking, Lord, Knoxville. Lord, I'm thinking anywhere but Michigan. And yet God said, no, follow me. And we had to go tell her mom and dad, tell my mom and dad, and tell our pastor, hey, we're going to go to Michigan. At some point, you're going to have to take all the 
family excuses and the reasons and the comfort and, and all the things. And, and Jesus says, follow me. Oh, Lord, I got an excuse. Wait a minute. No, you're going to have to leave that excuse. You're going to have to say, Lord, I'll, I'll let my family take care of themselves. My mother-in-law is probably, I, I don't say this lightly. I, I know I say a lot of things. That's my favorite song or I like this. I, I, my favorite passage. I, I know y'all get kind of thinking that everything's my favorite, but when we sing it, it really is my favorite. When I read it, that's my, that moment is my favorite. But I, I think about people in my life that I respect, greatly respect. My mother-in-law is one of those people. And I don't mean just, oh, I respect her because she brought me my wife and all that. But when my mother-in-law went with her husband to Haiti for the first time, I cannot to this day Imagine that. Taking three children, Julie hadn't been born yet, she was actually born in Haiti. Taking three children under the age of eight, nine, eight or nine, right in there. Get on a plane. She'd never been to Haiti. Freed went for like seven days. She'd never been there. Hey, we're going to move to Haiti. Get off the plane. Those of you that went to Haiti and got off the plane at Port-au-Prince, this was the new and improved airport we went to. Where they went to was, welcome to the third world right off the coast South Florida, and dragging them little that little girl, them two little, both them little, them little boys were just tiny, tiny. And you think about disease infested and all that, and, and her mother, and her father, and her family. I said preacher, was that worth it all? I don't know, but I know this: all four of their kids love the Lord. Amen. Their family's still together. They they've had a great impact on a lot of people, including me, and now you. And I'm saying that at some point. Betty, not just freed because the man is the preacher and the man is called, but the wife had to say, I'll go with you. I'll surrender my, my mother and father. By the way, her father died while they were on the field. By the way, her father-in-law died while they were on the field. By the way, her sister died while they were on the field. By the way, uh, not sister, her uh, sister-in-law died while they were on the field. Her brother-in-law died while they were on the field. Said, man, that's not easy, no but it was surrender. Why? Because she had a greater call to follow him than be comfortable with family and friends. Amen. Now, I'm going to make this statement and hasten. I really want us to see our church not just support missionaries, but send missionaries. I want some of you young people that we're training and pouring our life into not to be satisfied with being just another member of our church, but to go and start a church where there is no church. Go and help a church that's struggling. Go and go into a foreign place and pour your life into a foreign people that have never heard the gospel. And I've heard the statements as you have. Why should some hear the gospel three and four times when there are others that have never heard it one time? I'm asking you young people, especially young men and women I'm training, will you consider surrendering comfort, family, what's known to follow him? Number three, Jesus pressed on uh, Matthew 9 verse 9. Jesus said, uh, verse number 9, as he passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. The receipt of custom, we, we love this guy, tax man. By the way, I just want to thank God for little Hudson. That's a little deduction for 2014. Say amen right there. But uh, Matthew, here's the problem with with Matthew. Matthew was working for the Romans. He was a man that had chosen a foreign government, an invading government, a, a, uh, uh, a corrupt government over his own people. He was making money hand over fist. See, here's the deal with the Romans. They didn't care how much taxes you charged as long as they got what they wanted. You could get as much as you could get. So a lot of times they'd say, give us five, he'd charge ten, he'd keep five. Give us six, he'd charge nine, keep three. So the people knew he was a thief, a liar, but here's a guy that was wealthy. Here's a guy that had protection of the Roman government. Here's a guy that was set. He was making money hand over fist. He was doing everything that he thought he needed to do to get ahead. He was living large. And Jesus said, follow me. Follow me. Money is not the root of all evil. 
but the love of money. To follow Christ means that money and things are to be servants, not masters. If you can't master your money, don't expect God to give you more. Because if money is going to be your master, God is not going to give you what will ultimately destroy you. Now, I don't mean this harshly, and I don't have not one person. I have no idea. Brother Paul, uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Morton, and the other ladies, they'll testify. I have no idea about our giving. I have no idea about this, that, or the other. I don't keep up with that. But I know this, that statistically, let's just say statistically, generally speaking, true statement, that the vast minority of the members provide the vast majority of the funds for local church work. That means that the vast majority ride on the coattails of the giving minority. To follow Jesus means this. You're a woman, and I, I, this was handed to me, and it shouldn't have been, but it was placed on my desk. You're a woman of modest means, but you write three checks. A woman of modest means. But you write three checks because the missionary needs support and we need to buy a new bus and your faith promise mission. So the Harrisons, the new bus, and regular faith promise. Now I wouldn't dare tell you who it was and I, it's not important. It should never have gotten in my hand but it left on my desk and I looked at it. Here's, here's what I would consider the widow's might. She's not the wealthiest in our church and, and she'd be embarrassed to death even for me to hold this in front of you. So I'll put it back away. But here's a woman that doesn't have but that says that doesn't matter. Very modest home. I've been in it. Very modest home. Very modest life. If I told you any more about it you might have guessed who she is but she's very involved in our ministry here. She's very involved in our children's program. I mean just a lot of activity in the, the Lord's work. But here's a woman that says you know what? Money's not what I'm here for. It's the work of Christ. To follow Christ means that if God blesses you financially, you're to use those finances to further the work of Christ. Amen. God doesn't bless you to have. God blesses you so the gospel can go out in greater way. I'm convinced of this. America is blessed because God wanted us to use what we had as a country to get missions and missionaries around the world. Amen. We're not blessed so we can sit around and talk about how much money we have and how much newer this and newer that. You say, oh, preacher, I'm struggling. None of us are struggling compared to the mass, vast majority of the world. Right. If you have any question about that, iPhone 6, Samsung Galaxy, cable bill, dog food bill, Starbucks bill, Dunkin' Donuts bill, say. Well, preacher, those are necessities. Don't, don't kid yourself. Please don't, don't, don't embarrass yourself about how slow you really are. Those are not necessities. Those are great privileges. By the way, I'm not against any of them. I, I want you to enjoy everything God has. And we, 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 we have been blessed. And I think one of the reasons that we personally as a family have been blessed is we've tried to be open and giving and make sure that we don't hold on, but we're more of a conduit. God lets us have it so we can push it along the way. And as God has blessed in that way, we just keep seeing God do more and more and more. But the moment that we start holding it, I believe God withholds it. Follow me means this job, these benefits, I'm going to use all this. And you study this out, you find several other places where Jesus dealt with those who had robbed others in other texts. And you find out, he said, you know what? I'm going to give back much more than I took. Why? Because to follow me means I'm going to use what I have, what resources God has given me, so that the gospel, I'm going to give my life to the gospel's sake. Number four, follow me. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after, him, after me, let him deny himself and follow me. Take up his cross, excuse me, and follow me. Matthew 16, verse 24. Follow me, not your money. Follow me, not your family. Follow me for the souls of men. 
Follow me over your own goals, dreams, and desires. I preached on this in the beginning of the Imagine series back 10 months ago. Hard to believe this year has gone by so quickly. But I preached on this and I said that most of us live tame, colorless dreams. We have very little that we imagine for ourselves. And if we would give this to God and let God have our life, God would, would, would take what we dream in black and white and He would make it high definition plasma. The little story is told. You've heard the story before. It's not a new story. I've probably told it here several times. I think it's one of the most strong illustrations. A little girl had a little fake bead of pearls that she just loved that she'd picked up at one of those dollar stores. She loved those little pearls and all her little life she wore those pearls and wore those pearls. As she got a little older, the daddy came to her one night and he was tucking her in and having their prayer time and he said, Honey, would you give daddy your little pearls? Oh, no, daddy. No, daddy. These are my pearls. He said, Oh, that's fine. That's fine. They prayed together, tucked her in, kissed her good night. Several weeks went on. Several weeks went past that point and he came in one night and he's tucking her in the bed and he said, he said Honey, would you give daddy your pearls? Oh, no, Daddy, these are my most favorite pearls in the whole world. He said, don't worry about it, Tucker. And this went on for a period of a year, a year and a half, where just every now and then he asked for her pearls. And every time she said, no, Daddy, these are my most favorite things in the world. And finally, one night, with great tears in her eyes, when, when he asked that same question, she said, Daddy, these are my most favorite things in the world, but you're my most favorite Daddy. And she handed him the pearls. And the daddy reached in his pocket and brought out a strand of solid, real pearls. Not the fake little dollar store pearls. And he explained that these were the valuable, real pearls and that he and mommy wanted to give them to her, but wanted her to realize that daddy always has something better. That's you and I. We're holding on to our gold, our little uh, pearls, and we're holding on to our little trinkets and mine, 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 what I want, what I want, where I want, when I want, who, who I want. And God says, if, if you'll just give that all to me, I got something better. The best illustration, this crossed my mind, I was just thinking about this. What's the guy's name down in Spring, Texas, Brother, brother Van Dyke, Brother Bob Van Dyke? Bob Van Dyke's a man of God. I love him dearly. He's just a good old guy. Bob and his wife had a special needs son. And uh, he grew to become a large man with the mind of an infant, of just a baby. To the point where Bob's ministry and life was put on hold for he and his wife to care for this child. This child would go into such fits of rage. Bob has told me that it's taken six or seven of their big strong men to restrain him, to calm him down. Now, I, uh, this is a later part of the story. They've had to put him in a special home, not because they didn't want to care for him. Physically, they could not care for him any longer. He's just so incredibly strong. And when he would go into these tantrums, these fits, imagine me uh, just out of control and you couldn't control it and your, your adrenaline and all that, and the mind of just a child. And this was a big old guy. He's much taller than me, more like Dustin's size. I think he was over six feet, if I'm mistaken. Big guy. Bob Van Dyke said that this little boy mind and this big boy body could be triggered by certain familiar things. And so one of the things that Bob liked to do was take him to McDonald's because he loved McDonald's and getting the toy, the Happy Meal. And so they'd go to McDonald's. And just like a dog where, you know, you, you have the Pavlov experiment where you ring the bell and the dog. This kid see McDonald's, he reckons in his mind... Happy Meal toy, he just gets so excited, so happy, so, so out of control. So they would go to McDonald's, and, and Bob tells this story, illustrating this very point, that if we'll give God what we should give him, our lives, he has something better. Bob said, we'd go to McDonald's, and he'd be happy, and we'd go home, and we'd go to McDonald's, be happy, and we'd go home. Bob said, one day, I'm watching the television, and they have an advertisement for Toys Are Us. And he thought in his mind, Toys R Us for my boy would be like a trip to Disneyland. He said, I am going to take my boy to Toys R Us and just going to let him walk around and have a big time. He said, this 
will be great. We parents have such good ideas. It's going to be epic. But Bob did not reckon, reconcile that on the way to Toys R Us was a McDonald's. Now this is a boy that doesn't get out much. When he gets out, he goes to McDonald's. When he gets happy, he's happy. They drove past the McDonald's. And Bob said, Bob told this, do you remember this story? He told this in the preacher's meeting or in the, in the Jubilee. He said, the next thing I know, this monster of a boy is coming out of the car, busting out, I mean, like getting out the door to McDonald's. And Bob said, I, I'm trying to restrain him. I couldn't, couldn't restrain him. I couldn't stop him. He's out of control. And he said, I, we almost died. He said, it was just crazy and couldn't console him. He said, we, we finally pulled into Toys R Us. And he said, I wrestled him inside. And when he got inside, it was what he wanted it to be. This incredible, oh my goodness. And he said, we had the best time. He said, but I almost lost him because of McDonald's. He said, Christian, here's your problem. You're satisfied with a Happy Meal and God has Toys R Us for you. You're talking about help you. What we've got to learn is, if I follow Him, I'm going to let go of what I think is best. I'm going to let go of the wrong woman or the wrong man or the wrong career or the wrong goals or the wrong thoughts. I'm going to say, God, what you have is always far greater. I won't give you any more of these tonight. You can look at them all. Just, just begin to do a chain search in your Bible. Follow me. Follow me wherever he leads. Follow him whatever he asks. Follow him when you don't understand. Follow him when you don't know how to follow him. I want you to notice the second part of the verse, and we'll be finished tonight. Verse number five, chapter five, verse number one. Be ye therefore followers of God. And then he tells us not only what we're supposed to do, he tells us how we're supposed to do it. As dear children. Let me give you four things I thought about this afternoon. We are to follow God as our children follow us. I need a volunteer. A small, tiny volunteer. Elijah, will you trust Uncle Brent? You want to come here, buddy? I would use Grant, but no. <laughs> Elijah's still my size. There's much candy waiting for you after this is over, okay? <laughs> How many of you parents have ever played this game? Now, the game has to be played on a counter at your house or any height that you can find, all right? Trust Uncle Brent, all right? Oh, well, wait a minute. Hang on just a second. Wait, anybody smaller? No, I'm just kidding. All right. Now, Elijah, I want you to jump right here. Jump. Oh, that's good. Isn't that sweet? Oh, that's right. Wait. Julie went home sick, so this illustration got so much better. All right. You ready? I'm gonna jump. Hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, as dads, we start right here, but what's the ultimate goal? Distance. We want distance, right? All right, ready? Jump. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, I want you to stand right here, and I'm gonna, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna do that. All right, look. Follow me, number one. I'll catch you. Follow me. Get plenty of candy after church. Thank you, buddy. I love you. Little kids. We, we've got Hudson at home now. At night, we, we, every kid establishes the go-to-bed routine. Well, we figured out this one for the little boy. I throw him up in the air and catch him. Throw him up in the air and catch him. Throw him. Three times. Throw him. That's all I got in me is three times. I'm tired after that. But uh, throw him up and catch him. And he just laughs. In his mind, simple, little mind, he thinks daddy's going to catch him. Follow me as dear children. 
I'm not going to let you fall. But Lord, if I deny self and if I give up stuff and, and if I, I trust you, that's like jumping off. And God says, yeah, I'm standing right here to catch you. Every kid I've ever had, we've played that game. Every kid, we, we played that game. Come on, let's do it. It happened in the pool when they first learned to jump in. Trust me, I'll get you. Be okay. Because children believe daddy is going to catch them. Why do you find it so hard to believe that God's going to let you fall? God's not going to let you fall. He's going to catch you every time. You struggle and you struggle. I don't know. I don't know. God's saying, just jump. I got you. I've never dropped anybody in the history of time. I got you. But it's a big gap. It's a God gap. You realize that? There is no big gap with God. To you and I, it looks like the Grand Canyon. To God, he's never even let go of our hand. Number one, as dear children means, follow him, he'll catch you. Number two, follow him as a mimic. Follow him as a mimic, like a child to a parent. Now, this has happened with all four of our children, now with our fifth. Whatever we do, they do. So the other day, we're in the kitchen, and I lean over and give Miss Valerie a big, wet, juicy, married kiss. <laughs> and the next thing you know, true story, Hudson comes up, grabs her, pulls her down, kisses her. <laughs> so then we just wanted to see how many times he'd do it. So I kept kissing, he kept kissing, I kissed, we kissed. Whatever we do, they follow when, Dad, was it not like the coolest day in your life when your little toddler who's just walking in diapers, you know, and all of a sudden he comes out of your bedroom with your size nine and a half, ten zone? <laughs> Every dad in this room has had their kids wear their shoes. And you're like, that's my boy. <laughs> Look at that. That's my boy. Dad, I want to go with you to cut the grass. Dad, I want to go with you to put gas. Let me put the gas in the car, Dad. Dad, I want to I wanna do what you're doing. That's how children learn. They mimic. Follow God. Just mimic. He gave us Christ as a perfect human example. I don't know how to, to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I don't know how to forgive as Christ forgave on the cross. I don't know how to serve as Christ girded himself about with the towel of service and washed the feet of his deceptive disciples. I don't know what to do. Mimic Christ. I'm going to follow Christ. How? Like a little child. I'm going to wear God's shoes. I'm going to hold God's hand. I'm going to, I'm going to cut the grass. I'm going to do whatever he does. I'm going to follow him. By the way, you know the term Christian is literally little Christ. It means carbon copy. Don't go try to figure this thing out for yourself. You've got the perfect example. Just pattern after him. Follow, follow me. I'll catch you. Follow me. I'll mimic you. Follow me. I believe everything you tell me. Curse of the Father is the ice cream cone. If you will do what I'm asking, we will go get an ice cream. What you've just told your child, is it upon the solemn authority of all heaven, all earth, the Constitution of the United States of America, the Geneva Convention, the Articles of War, the United States, whatever, we are going to get ice cream. You will forget about the ice cream. Three-year-olds... Do not forget about ice cream. Daddy, when are we getting ice cream? 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 You said we're getting ice cream. We're going to get ice cream. We're going to get ice cream. We're going to get ice cream. Going to get ice cream. I, I'm going to kill you if you say ice cream. You said we're getting ice cream. Get ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream. Finally, what do you do? We're going to go get the ice cream because he will never. They don't forget. If you tell them, if you tell it to them, it is an iron-clad contract. Breakable only by your sure insanity. 
we're going to get a snow cone. Okay. That means that at some point in the near future, we are going up to Rita's and get a snow cone. So what we've learned is caveat that we will pray about getting a snow cone. We will pray about ice cream. Here's the thing. You tell your kids something. They believe you. We're going we're gonna to go, we're gonna, we're gonna go back to Texas to see Miss B. When we leave them, when we leave them. Well, I mean, that's kind of a general statement. We're going to go back. No, when we leave, you said we're going to Texas. When we leave, when we leave. They believe every word you say. They don't doubt. Daddy said it. That means it's going to happen. As they get older, unfortunately, we've let them down. They don't believe that. But, man, when they're little, they believe every word you say. They, they don't. Daddy said it. It's, hey, Daddy said it. Why? Mama said it. Daddy said it. It's, it's, that's it. There's God and Mama, and that's it. Follow me as dear children. Which, which one of these promises are you staggering with? Which one of these promises... Are you not able to trust exactly? At what time did God ever promise you something and let you down? Follow me. Just believe what I tell you. I got you under control. David said, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I, I, I was young. Now I'm old. He said, I've, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. I've never seen a, a faithful Christian tithing member ever destroy God's promise to cover you care for you. Doesn't mean you're going to be problem free. It doesn't mean you're going to be problem free. Doesn't mean you're going to have not have some difficulties. But he said I am your shelter in the storm. I'm that cleft in the rock. We stagger. Hey Sarah, guess what? What is it, God? You're going to have a baby. <laughs> Why? Why are you laughing? Is there anything too hard for me? Well, Lord, that that's I mean I, I know you can did I make the statement the other week about if you can believe the first miracle, you can believe all the rest of the miracles? Right. Do you ever think about that? If you can believe the first miracle, the Latin term is ex nihilo. It means out of nothing, God created everything. If you can believe the first miracle, that God out of nothing spoke the worlds into existence, there's really not a miracle that could bother you after that. Because right. out of nothing, he created everything. So you're going to let a fish and a swimmer bother you, not a lick. That Jonah thing, don't even think about that. Why? Because he created everything out of nothing. Oh, you mean that I'm going to be taken care of as a child of God? Yeah, because he created everything out of nothing. I don't worry about his supply problem. Because if you don't have it, he'll just make it. He'll just make the barrel not run out. He'll just make the oil continue to flow. He'll just make the ravens, if necessary, bring delivery. Long before there was a Domino's, there was a raven delivery service. Just believe God. Like a little child believes mom and dad. Believe me. These promises are not just for me to have something to preach. They're for you to hold on to when the difficulties come. When the uncertainties come. When the trials come. Follow me. Where? Wherever. How? However. When? Whenever. Just follow me. Well, how am I supposed to follow you? Like a little child. Next time you're worried about God following through, think about Elijah jumping. Say, you know what? God's always going to catch me. God's always, always going to tell me the truth. God's always going to tell me the truth. I just need to follow him, mimic him, pattern after him. Father, I pray this evening you'd help us. Simple, simple thought I know. Remember that lesson as a boy, my father talking about me driving the car. Lord, I remember that to this day. Probably I remember Curtis telling him that and preaching that before even I remember Daddy telling me. But God, I pray you'd help us to realize that following you is just like a little child holding Daddy's hand. And Lord, to that little child, there's not a problem in the world that Daddy can't solve. And oh, we have such a better Daddy than an earthly Daddy. We got our Heavenly Father. We hold to that unchanging hand of an Almighty God. And Lord, there's nothing that you are unable to do for us. We pray you'd help us now just to learn to follow you like a little boy, a little girl follows their daddy. Trust their mama. 
Lord, it's so important we as mom and daddies have that good reputation, that good pattern for them to follow. Lord, I pray you'd help us tonight. Heads are about eyes are closed. One precious young lady this morning needed to trust Christ. To my knowledge, still hasn't. Pray for her. Several others raised their hand, didn't come forward. Pray for them. Others that came this morning and made some decisions. So thankful for Melissa from a Christ in baptism today. Rejoice over that. Others of you that made decisions, I rejoice over that. But now we come to another service, another place. Another opportunity for God to speak to us. If you're here tonight and God is speaking to your heart, maybe you're not saved, you need to trust Christ as Savior. Maybe you have been saved, but you, you've never followed Christ in believer's baptism. Maybe you've never joined with a church that believes the Bible to be the Word of God. Maybe you need to make other decisions. Maybe God is calling you to follow me. Follow me. Denying of self. Denying of selfish ambition. Putting the Lord before everything else. Job, family, friends, comfort, notoriety, fame, fortune. Maybe you're struggling tonight that you're worried he ain't going to catch you. But I'll never leave you, never say, I got you. Let's stand to our feet, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Folks have already begun to come. Maybe you'll come tonight and join them. Jonathan begins to sing a song. Some have come, others are coming. Whatever your need is, you step out of your place, you come.
look up this way. Gentlemen, you get ready to come. We want to make announcements tonight and they'll receive our offering, be dismissed, and have a great week. A lot going on this week. Excited about all the opportunities. We have FBI tomorrow, 10 o'clock, tomorrow night. Uh, we're really, boy, I want you to come out for visitation. We've had great nights for that. Uh, we're just right knocking on the 50 door, and uh, praise the Lord for that. We want to see a great crowd out for, uh, Tuesday night. Wednesday night, Bible study, 226, setting record numbers. We're excited about that. Then Thursday, best night of the week, are you and uh, are you 703 meeting me? Seeing a lot of neat things happen there. So uh, excited about all these opportunities. I want you to pray. Uh, we have some surgeries coming up. Rodney's going to have surgery this week and uh, ask the Lord to help him through that. And then Wally is next week. So we're praying for Brother Wally as he's gearing up for his surgery as well. But Lord is having his cancer surgery next week as well. And Paul and Bonnie, I had no idea that y'all were involved in a car wreck. But Brother Paul told me that today. And so praise the Lord for your safety and everything work out well. Just bumps and bruises, nothing serious. And uh, you've got to watch these snowbirds, Vonda. They're terrible drivers. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. Paul, God bless you. We're so glad you guys are home. That's one of the sweetest, sweetest families. And then I see Ruby. Is Warren here as well? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh there he is. There he is. Good. But uh, Ruby and Warren were on vacation. A couple that missed them. And uh, they, they uh, greatly missed. Glad to see them home. Did you have a good time, Ruby? Everything go well? Did you enjoy that? Wonderful. And you brought Warren back. I'm sorry about that, okay? But uh, I was thinking maybe just overboard, you know, and that'd be it. So, yes? He didn't shave for a week. Oh, he's got a little, he looks like the Morton Salt guy. Look at him right there. Good. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, receive the offering. Be faithful in your giving. Gentlemen, here's three checks that I want to turn in right now. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And then we'll receive the offering. Be the, uh, special music tonight is, is uh, Miss uh, Marty. All right, Miss Marty's going to play for us. Father, bless now the time. Thank you for the sweetness of your people. Thank you for Brother Caleb and Miss Nicole. Great job tonight, Lord. We pray that you bless them uh, in their ministry and service. And Lord, all of our other young men and ladies in the ministry. And we praise the Lord for these young people. Thank you for those that are training, God. And I pray those that are doing the work here now, our faithful bus drivers and workers and children's workers, Lord, so many. Thank you for all you're, done, all you're doing, what you have done, what you are doing in this place. And now, Lord, the week is before us. It's a brand new week, a fresh slate. Help us to follow you. Bless the gift and the giver, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you as you give. couple of quick announcements. First of all, we have our Senior, senior Saints Bible Study this Tuesday morning at 1030 over in Barnard Hall. Uh, make sure you bring a dish uh, to eat afterwards during the, uh, during the meal. Also, we have teen outreach coming up this uh, Saturday morning at 1030. We go out and we're going to pass out flyers. Then we go out. We're probably going to go uh, eat somewhere this, this week as well. Uh, this also, this, this next Sunday, October 
19th after this uh, service, we're having our teen afterglow. We're going to go to Steak and Shake. So all of the teenagers and myself and my wife and the workers are going to load up on a bus. Go to Steak and Shake. We're going to hang out. We're going to take over Steak and Shake. Also next Sunday morning after the church service, there's a nursery worker slash nursery parent meeting. So if you're a parent of a child in the nursery or you work in the nursery in any fashion, uh, make sure you're at that mandatory meeting next Sunday morning after the service. Uh, Tonight there's going to be a meeting involving anybody that is wanting to work in our trunk or treat come up October 31st. So if you're interested in that, I know we've got several meetings. There's a teacher's meeting. There's a 226 meeting. But after those two meetings, there's going to be a quick trunk or treat meeting. Also, I've been informed that there is one of our assistant pastors that is not on the platform will be dressing up as Peter Pan at the trunk or treat. I don't know if that's going to make everybody come or not, but that's what I was told. So make sure you guys are there for that as well. That's just what I was told to make the announcement. I I didn't throw you under the bus. It wasn't me. Um, So there's that as well. Also, our scripture calendars are for sale in the lobby, out in the, in the information booth, if you want to sign up for those as well. Uh, Brother John. There actually will not be a Sunday school teachers meeting this evening, uh, so take that and uh, you will not have a meeting. I was kind of hoping for Tinkerbell, actually, after this morning, what was said. Uh, Peter Pan, I guess, will work. But uh, we had a great afternoon over at Miss Kelly's. I think we had 26 young adults over there. And just an awesome time getting to eat some great lasagna and meatballs and hear the testimony there. And that was just a great blessing. Uh, don't forget Rogers and Hammerstein Cinderella. I know I won't for a long time. And uh, that'll be October the 24th, and we'll leave at 6.30. This week we're going to be visiting the Mosley bus route, and we're excited about that, excited about Open House Week, and as I encourage you this morning to pray about that, pray that we'll have some parents come in, and that we'll, ab- we'll be able to have an inroad into their lives, and if nothing else, that they'll he- hear the gospel. And we'll be asking a few of you that are normally over there to come over and help us deal with people toward the end, uh, dealing with people for salvation and whatnot, so uh, just be prepared for that. Uh, 226 meeting right afterwards, right here in this wing. Please be at that if you work in 226, and that will not be long, but please, please, please be there. And then 7 p.m., uh, we have a softball game tomorrow night at Woodlawn. If you play, please be there at 630, and that will be a great blessing. All right, Pastor? Where is the, uh, where is the trunk or treat meeting? Barnard Hall. Barnard Hall. Huh? One more announcement. Also, the uh, Missions and Me Girls are going to be doing a service project this year, and they're going to be collecting uh, any sort of toys, any kind of items that we might be able to put into a gift bag for the 226 kids, and they're going to be collecting those items to where we can give a bag to each and every uh, kid in 226. So there is, Miss Lisa, there's a box out there already, and if you have anything you'd like to donate to that, please do so. That was a neat thing there. Missions and Me girls had a meeting today about just training these young people out missions and what it is to be a missionary. <clears throat> I'd like to see a good number of you go down to the meeting for the Trunk or Treat. This is a church-wide outreach for this community, okay? And uh, you need to be involved. Some of you younger that have the ability and some of you older, you can be involved in helping some younger ones, working together. But we need to have a great, great response to this because it's a chance to reach families. If you go down to any of these festivals where the families come in, uh, you can meet them, you can talk to them, get them maybe engaged uh, in our ministries here, uh, witness to them, try to get them to come. So let's have a great turnout down at Barn Hall and uh, you decorate your trunk or treat and we'll be excited about that. And if nothing else, to see Paul in green leotards, it would be well worth it, all right? So we look forward to that. Let's all stand together. Anything else? Have we forgotten anything? By the way, let me say this. Miss Kelly's group, uh, the girls' class made probably the nicest fruit basket. Apparently, it is Pastor Appreciation Month, and they made the nicest fruit basket I've ever seen in my life and brought that to me today. I praise the Lord for anything that has something to do with eating, so we rejoice over that. I love you. God bless you. Thank you, ladies. You're dismissed.